Uh, good morning. Um, I'm here to harm your sensibilities. Um, who here is using Masterless right now? Impressive. I had no idea there were this, this many people actually using Masterless. Um, who here is considering using it, Masterless? It's hmm. pretty good. So this talk will not only cover Masterless, but it's also going to cover AWS orchestration, using Docker without Docker files, all kinds of stuff that will make you feel horrible about what I'm doing. <coughs> so my name is Ryan Lane. I'm a DevOps engineer at Lyft. Um, there was that great DevOps talk this morning about what the hell is DevOps actually. Um, so um, at our organization, we have a, a DevOps team. It's about four people. Mostly what we do is uh, write tooling and things like that, do consulting, et cetera. Um, and this is specifically because our engineering culture is if you build it, you run it. So our developers are uh, primarily responsible for their own services, which includes um, the operations of it, so they're primary on call. Um, they are also uh, responsible for everything regarding their service, the architecture of their service, the performance of their service, monitoring, logging, um, as well as orchestration and configuration management of their own services. The DevOps team acts as a consultant between other teams. Um, we run a service-oriented architecture, and um, we have a very large number of services. Um, what the DevOps team does is it, will, it interacts with all of the teams. It writes tooling to support them doing their operations uh, to ensure that everything is consistent across the services and um, that everything generally just works. Um, one of the big things that we aim for is, auto uh, is, uh, is for teams to be able to work autonomously. Um, <clears throat> and so to, um, to go towards this model, we have a number of constraints in our architecture. Um, the first constraint that we have is purely cultural. So um, we want to ensure that our teams can operate independently of each other. And when you're looking at configuration management and orchestration, um, a common thing that you'll see is very abstract reusable modules. We don't do that. Um, in our infrastructure, we have a base repository, which is shared uh, configuration management orchestration code, but it does kind of like the bare necessities. It has things like um, consistent logging locations and formats. It has StatsD, CollectD. It has our Splunk configuration. It has our sets of users. It has our security policies and such, but it has absolutely nothing about the services. Everything that is for the services is contained inside of each service's own repository. Their configuration management orchestration code, their orchestration code for monitoring and logging, alerting, et cetera, is all in their own repositories, and it's maintained by their own teams. Um, of course, this goes into the culture constraint that everything is infrastructure as code. So everything that the developers do for their own services is controlled by code. We, aim, we strive for no uh, manual work of any kind. Everything has to be definable, and everything is definable by salt states. Um, from a scalability and availability perspective, we've gone with the notion that we will have no masters. Um, this is, of course, our current goal, is to have no masters. It's what we're doing. Um, we started this way so that we have constraints that we limit ourselves to. Um, in our environment, we're using Amazon Web Services. We have multiple availability zones, and we architect everything so that we can lose an entire availability zone and be fine. Um, what we wanted to avoid is jumping into a configuration management and orchestration system where we had to worry about losing a master and being down, not being able to auto scale, not being able to, uh, to push code, et cetera. Um, we also had constraints on consistency. We have a large number of services, and in these services, we have a bunch of environments. We, what we aim for is for all of the services to be as consistent as possible uh, between each other, but also inside of a single service, we need each one of the environments to be as close to each other as possible. So let's um, look at uh, a simple example service. Um, so this is a simple stateless service. All of our services are completely stateless, um, where we have an auto-scaling group that actually runs the code. It's backed by some data store. In this case, it is DynamoDB. It has a load balancer in front to move the traffic between the nodes in the auto-scaling group. And it has a Route 53 CNAME so that people from the outside world can address it via DNS. 
when looking at this, it's, it, it looks pretty simple to just not have to orchestrate this. Instead, go through the process of creating all of these things individually. Except that in a few months, you start looking at, well, the, um, the response time of the service is not very good. We're doing too much synchronous work. We need to kind of pull some of the synchronous work out, push it into queues, and then have workers that pop things off the queue. But we also want to ensure that we don't have duplication of work, so we'll keep some state in a Redis node. So then you have to create another auto-scaling group that has your workers that pull stuff off of SQS queues that you also have to create that's also talking to a Redis system that lives in Elastic Cache. Um, so this is still pretty manageable, except then you notice, well, I also really need to create all of the monitoring alerting for this stuff too. So you add, you add um, SNS notifications from CloudWatch alarms that integrate to PagerDuty, and then you start adding dashboards and things like Grafana, Splunk, uh, et cetera. And then you realize, well, my developers are pushing code to production. It's breaking things. Even though they're testing it in their developer environments, they don't have an environment that looks exactly like production. It doesn't have all the same sets of data and such. So then you start looking at, well, we need to have multiple environments for this. And then this is where you start looking at, well, this is impossible to maintain in any other way than doing orchestration, especially when you consider that you're going to have a ridiculous number of services. So every service that you add will have the multiple environments. So the orchestration task for this starts becoming crazy. It's, it, it, not just the orchestration, but also the configuration management, because all of your systems also need to look the same between all of these things. So um, this is uh, the basic way that we're doing things. Inside of each um, services repository, we have a salt directory. Inside of that, we have directories for orchestration and configuration management. Inside of both of these, <coughs> we have states, pillars, and modules. So um, a service team can add their own custom modules. They can add their own custom states and, and use pillars. Um, and all of it's control controlled via makefile that is uh, run via Jenkins. <clears throat> um, we also have a very standard naming convention for all of our resources. Sorry, with the first question being, do you want questions as you go, or do you want to just... Let's do them, let's do them afterwards, because otherwise I might not make it through the talk. <laughs> um, so we have a, a very explicit naming convention for all of our resources. This is an example of a naming convention for one of our um, EC2 instances. So the naming convention here is service name dash service instance, which is an environment, dash region, dash uh, service node for EC2 instances. They have an instance ID, for instance. So, and then dot domain. So we take these, we take these resource names and we can parse them into grains that we can use in both orchestration and configuration management. So looking at this, it parses directly into these grains. Some of these grains are just combinations of other grains. Um, if we look at an entire cluster, we name everything on our cl entire cluster the exact same way. So our cluster would be like example production ID. Our ELB would have the exact same name. Our um, auto scaling group would have the same name. Its launch configuration would have the same name. Its IAM role has the same name. All the instances have the same naming convention. The SQS queues have that naming convention. The Elastic Cache has the same naming convention. DynamoDB, et cetera. Every single resource follows the same naming convention. Um, there's a reason that we do this. So if we look at the orchestration for these services, um, we do kind of a weird thing in that um, our orchestration is run from kind of a centralized node that is also stateless. Our Jenkins server is, um, doesn't really hold state. It can die and come back and we will, we will be fine. Um, but it runs the orchestration. So it doesn't actually know, like, I'm on this system, I have these grains. So instead, we inject um, environment variables during a salt run that get translated into grains so that we can use the exact same things in orchestration and configuration management. So let's go over an example of how we actually do the orchestration. Um, we do this all through salt states that run in the sequential order, and they're all completely templatized. So for a particular service, everything in that service is, has a template that uses the grains we generally try to use cluster names so that everything has the exact same name. Cluster name is, is the service-service instance-region. So if we were to call the same template for um, staging and production, the exact same infrastructure would come up. If you make changes and you call it again, it just modifies your infrastructure so that both look exactly the same. Um, similarly, if you switch regions, same concept. You can have the same infrastructure in different regions using the exact same template. 
this is an example of an IAM role. Um, in this specific case, we are um, giving the, this cluster the ability to um, do everything for uh, SQS queues in its own, that everything that's prefixed with its own cluster name. So any SQS queue that starts with its cluster name, it has access to create, destroy, um, add things to, remove, et cetera. Um, there's also one thing to notice on here is that we have the ability to pull some policies from pillars. Um, so all of our systems need to look basically the same, including how they bootstrap themselves. So we have a set of IAM policy that lives in pillars that defines the bootstrap policy for every single resource that we have. And in this particular one, it allows it to do things like go to S3, get its deployment artifacts, go off and like report its status to different things, et cetera. Um, <coughs> Another, uh, the next step that we would probably go through in creating uh, a cluster is to create a security group. And so uh, in here, like earlier, we use grains so that we have, uh, so that we can do templates for this. And in this case, we are giving access to port 443 to a named security group. There's something to notice about this is that we're using a VPC. Um, if you've used Amazon and you've used VPCs, then you know that you cannot actually use named security groups when you're referencing security groups in the VPC. Um, so we've written these modules in such a way that you can always use name resources. You never have to use any IDs that come from Amazon so that you can do a full run and only use references to the other resources. So what this state will do is it will see that it's modifying a VPC security group. It will look up the name for the security group. It will translate that into a security group ID and it will use that to talk back and forth to Amazon. Next, we create an ELB. Um, similar to the security group, um, if you notice, we are using a um, security group that is a name security group. The name for the security group is a reference to the security group we just created. And it also uses the grains so that everything references uh, each other completely through, um, template, uh, through templates. So <coughs> in this example, it will create an ELB that um, forwards, that does SSL termination and forwards to port 80, does a health check. And there's also something to notice on here is that we have the ability to pull some attributes from pillars as well. Something that we've noticed as we have a large number of consistent services is that all of the services need some basic things. For instance, for every single ELB that we have, we want to store our ELB logs in S3. So in our pillars, we have a policy for, uh, for the attributes that say all of the ELB logs go to this location, where that location is specific to this cluster. Um, since we're using um, masterless, we also have the ability to, uh, to manage our pillars using grains, which makes this a lot easier. Um, <coughs> another thing to note about this is that um, the ELB itself will manage its own C names. So when you create the ELB, if you say this ELB should have these C names, the ELB state will create the ELB, and then we'll create Route 53 um, addresses that point at the ELB. We also have the ability for, the, uh, for some of our resources to manage their own CloudWatch alarms. Um, in this particular example, we're managing a CloudWatch alarm for the, for the ELB through a pillar. And this has a check that um, will send an alert if there's any unhealthy instances in our ELB. Um, one thing to note about this is it's a pillar, and this specific key is a default key for that, uh, for that state. So if you define this particular key, this will apply to every single one of your ELBs unless you override the key that's being used. So um, our motto uh, as a DevOps team is that things should be easy to do correctly and hard to do incorrectly. So in general, if you create an ELB, you automatically get a set of CloudWatch alarms that do things like check for unhealthy hosts, send alerts on, um, if your latency is too high for your service, as defined, if you have um, too many errors being sent from your application, and all of these get sent directly to developers. So if a developer creates a service, they are automatically on call for a service, and they get um, alarms that are pre-set up for them. Next, we create an auto-scaling group and a launch configuration. If you've used auto scaling groups, then you've probably, I mean, then you had to have used launch configs and you probably know how much of a pain in the ass they are. 
Um, you can only create and destroy launch configurations. Um, Amazon does not give you full CRUD operations for these. So if you modify, if you want to modify a launch configuration, you have to create a new one, associate it with the autoscaling group, and delete the old one. Um, so to avoid this, because that would never work in a configuration management system, we have the autoscaling group manage its own launch configuration. So if you make any changes to the launch configuration in this definition, it will automatically create a new launch configuration, associate with the autoscaling group, and delete the old one. So you, have, you don't have to worry about managing launch configurations at all. Um, <coughs> this is also where we inject our cloud in it. So for this specifically, um, it, it's a little lengthy to include in, in the example, but this is where we bootstrap salt. Um, in our particular case, we pre-generate a virtual env from a container. We tarball it up, we push it into S3. Uh, it's public because it's just a, a public version of salt, basically. Um, that gets pulled down onto the systems when they bootstrap and then can just run directly from that since it's built in the same architecture. Um, one, thing to notice about, uh, one thing to know about here is that it supports things like scaling policies. Um, it, we, we also propagate our tags through to our instances, and this is how we handle our naming convention. So when our instances boot and they bootstrap themselves, they find their tag name for their autoscaling group, and that's how they derive their own host names. They set the host name explicitly on the system so that things like logging, has, uh, like logging systems have the host name defined so that you can do searches across instances and such. <coughs> um, if we were to use a master, this would also make it easier for us to generate proper master certs or minion certs for our master. Um, there's one thing to note about this as well. Um, autoscaling groups also support creating their own CloudWatch alarms. So in this particular case, we can um, send a scale-up event um, based on a CPU um, policy that says at 60% scale. This is based on our model of having one availability zone be able to go down so we can handle an, a full AZ outage, we scale at 60%. So in this particular case, um, one thing that we want to add to the state is also the, the ability to define your scaling policies themselves through pillars with a default key. And our goal with this is if a service creates its own autoscaling group, that autoscaling group will automatically have a policy that says at 60% CPU, your service will scale by X number of nodes. Um, similarly, we're going to do the same for scaled down events. So every one of our service, services automatically has uh, services that scale up and scale down based on load without the developer having to deal with making a scaling policy at all. Um, we don't just do orchestration for our Amazon resources. We also do it for all of our monitoring, our logging, et cetera. So um, this is an example of a Splunk log, uh, log alarm that will send to PagerDuty. And <coughs> this example will send uh, a PagerDuty event on any single error that occurs over a 30 minute period. This is a very aggressive policy. We would get paged a lot for this. This is not what we actually use, but um, it's just an example. I would never want to be the service owner for this. Um, we also have orchestration for Grafana. Um, who here is using Graphite? Hmm, a lot less than I would think. Um, anyone using InfluxDB? So Grafana is a dashboard for both of these products. It's quite nice. It can use Elasticsearch as a back end. Um, we have a, um, an orchestration module for this it will talk to Elasticsearch and manage dashboards. So unlike uh, some other states, this one acts kind of strangely. So um, in, our, in our infrastructure, we want our service owners to add their own custom metrics in their services. We want them to add their, they, to rose their dashboards so they can monitor their custom metrics and such. So what this does is it will create a dashboard if one does not exist and will add a set of managed rows. The next time it runs, it will ensure that the dashboard exists, and it will ensure that the managed rows are managed. Anything else that exists inside of the Grafana dashboard does not get modified. So um, developers can go in, they can add their own custom rows, they can reorganize the rows in whatever order they want. It stays like that. The only thing that is managed is the rows that we manage ourselves. So for instance, every service that comes up, by default, will have a certain set of dashboards. So for instance, server health, uh, like system health, um, basic things about the service itself, like um, its response time, 
its um, a number of errors, its general load. Um, and then also things, if it has an ELB, it will get an ELB policy, or it will also get an ELB dashboard, which shows general metrics from, um, from Amazon. Here's an example of a dashboard that is generated. Um, so a service. We, our Grafana is, um, every service is in the same Grafana. Yeah. So this is an example of a dashboard that's, that gets created. It has um, like call volume, response time, and error rate. And then it has some information about the ELB traffic. And then it has information here about, that comes from G-Unicorn, from just general G-Unicorn stats. This is a set of modules that we've written and upstreamed to Salt that are available for use. Um, we have a lot of Amazon things to use here. They're all quite nice. You should look at them at least. We also have a few for, um, for external services. And we have one that we haven't upstreamed yet. This is for um, MMS. If you're a Mongo user, you've probably used MMS for alerts. Um, we do have a module for it. We're waiting on some changes from MMS themselves and their API before we upstream this, but hopefully it will be soon because they said they're fixing the issue for us. So hopefully in the next month or two we'll have that. Um, here's how we actually call the orchestration. As I mentioned, we pass environment variables in to um, salt. We actually use a wrapper. Um, since we're running this on a Jenkins server, we don't want to run it as root. Um, and we need to be able to call this for multiple services at the same time. Um, unless you use concurrent or you use queued, um, salt doesn't really handle running multiple versions of salt call at the same time. Um, so we. And we also want to be able to, uh, to limit the scope of what this thing is doing for a particular service. So we generate a configuration, we put it in a tempter, and then we run the wrapper that's just calls salt with state.sls against a specific um, SLS <coughs> module inside of the repo's uh, orchestration directory. So for configuration management, I'm not gonna go too heavily into what we're doing. Um, we're doing sequential ordering. And, um, and since it's masterless, the tops are somewhat interesting. Um, the pillar top, we're actually using grains to manage our pillars, which we would never do if you're using a master because it's horribly insecure. But since we're using masterless, it doesn't matter. All of the pillars already exist in the system anyway, except for external pillars, which come from an external system anyway. So the protection comes from the external, external system rather than protecting it at the, the pillar system. Um, in this specific case, we always load our base pillars first, then we, we load our service pillars so that they can override base pillars if necessary. And then we also have um, something that will match based on the service group, which is the service name dash service instance or environment. Um, but this, um, not all services define any pillars for, um, for their environments. Some just use the service level, level pillars, especially for some environments. So what we do here is, um, I added a feature to the pillar system, to the top system, to where you can tell it to ignore any missing files. So for this particular one, it will check to see if something exists for that environment, and if it doesn't, it just ignores it. Um, for the top uh, system for states, it's very basic. It says load the base states, load the service states. Since we're doing sequential ordering, we know that everything from the base will get applied and then everything from the service will get applied. Um, us doing it this way and doing sequential ordering means that the service owners never have to care about what's going on in base. They have a base system that comes up, but the only thing they need to care about is what's in their own service definitions. I'm going to install Apache, I'm going to install PHP, it's going to have these set of modules, et cetera. They don't need to know that there's Splunk on the system, that there's um, basically anything else on the system that is shared except that they need, they know they have to write in specific log directories, that they have to do other things. And for some of these things, we have mechanisms to make this automatic. <coughs> From the salt configuration itself, one thing you'll notice is that we're using fail hard. Um, this is specific to um, doing sequential or, uh, ordering. And also from a reliability point of view, um, we deploy, on every single deploy, we run a high state. And if the high state fails, the deployment fails. And that propagates back to the developer. They have to fix their code before they can continue. We never allow a failed state to continue because that makes the reliability of runs less reliable and less repeatable. <clears throat> 
And it also puts your cluster in weird states if you have new systems that come up that have done a full run that have not modified the state of the system when you have other systems that have already been there and are redoing runs and such. <clears throat> There's also the way that we handle the follow routes, the pillar routes, and the module dirs. If you notice here that we have, um, we have two separate locations on the file systems. We have one that's base and then we have one that's service. We have two separate artifacts that come down, one that's managed, that's, uh, managed centrally as base and then one of the, another one that is service specific. Um, we have locations on the file system that are specific to those things. So we only run one service per cluster. No other services are allowed to run on, on, on this particular cluster. Um, this simplifies things for us because we can always know that our code for the service is in serve service. We know that base is in serve base. Um, for the system itself, we have this concept of uh, next and current. Um, this is the current state of the system that the application is running in, and then we have the next state of the system, which is a deployment concept. So salt always points at next. We only ever run salt when we're doing a deployment. Um, either that or next happens to be pointing at current. So um, I'll go into the deployment a little later, but <clears throat> that's the basic concept there. We also do use external pillars. I've removed the configuration for this because it's not terribly important. We use etcd for some things, and then we also have a custom uh, service written for secret management. So we have an external pillar for that as well. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have this consist very consistent naming scheme. What this allows us to do is to kind of not have to use service discovery very much. Um, one service can easily reference another service. Um, all it needs to know is the service name. Otherwise, it knows what, um, it knows what environment it's in, it knows what region it's in, uh, et cetera. So it has the ability to say, if I want to talk to this other service, I just use its name. <coughs> in this example, um, this is for our development environment where we have a local container that runs all of the fake Amazon services so that our local development can just talk to a, a local thing. So it just happens to point all of its resources at this local container. So from the deployment point of view, our goal is to make this as simple as possible for developers. So from the developer's point of view, this is all they do. It's a normal development process. They create a feature branch, um, which could modify their service itself or their orchestration, their configuration management, um, their monitoring, logging, et cetera. They um, push it in for review. They get a review from someone. Um, then they ensure all the tests are passing. They merge the pull requests, and then they do a deployment via Jenkins pipeline. Everything after that point in time is completely automated. The things on the left are orchestrated, and the things on the right are configuration management that occurs on the instances themselves. So from the deployment point of view, on our, for the orchestration point of view, the first thing that Jenkins will do is it will generate an artifact. It does this using make, it does make build, which will create a tarball artifact of the repository and anything that it needs to run. So for instance, if it's running front end code, it will do things like a grunt build, which will run compass and all of the other th like wire dependencies, et cetera, generate the front end code, inject it in the artifact. Then we tar that up, we push it into S3, and then we release it to an environment, which is really just saying for this service in this environment, you're supposed to be running this git SHA. Then we run our orchestration code, which will set up things like if the Amazon resources don't exist, it will create all of them. If they do exist, it will make sure they're in the right state. Um, similarly, for all of the monitoring and dashboarding and things like that. Yes. Um, past that, uh, everything after that is configuration managed. So um, when a system notices that it has a new artifact to pull, it will fetch all the artifacts. It keeps a certain number of the artifacts on the system at all times so they can quickly roll back and roll forward when need be. Um, then it will switch the next link to point at the SHA that is supposed to be the new deployment artifact. After doing so, it runs any pre-deployment hooks that are set up inside of the repository that need to happen at the system level. Then it will run salt. Um, it will do a full high state run based on the next artifact. If that succeeds, it will switch the current link to the current SHA so that next and current are now pointing at the same thing. So any salt run that happens after this point in time now happens at the current state of the system, whether even though it's always pointed at next. Um, at, this point, we run post-deployment hooks. 
Um, this is the point in which we do things like uh, hop Apache, or restart Python services, or restart Go services, et cetera. So the idea behind this is that the applications are always running the current state. So even if salt runs and fails, when it's modifying the system, this, the application is in memory. It has everything that needs in memory. That state doesn't change until a successful deployment has occurred. So if something happens on a system and it fails, this propagates back to the developer. And they see in Jenkins that it's failed. They look at the logs in Splunk to see why the deployment failed. They fix it. They push in a new deployment artifact. And then they continue on. At the very end of this, it reports its status. This allows Jenkins to know what's going on. It reports it back into etcd, and Jenkins will poll etcd to see if the deployment has succeeded on the systems. From the developer's point of view, this is all they see. They see a Jenkins pipeline. When they go to deploy something, in this particular application, we have it, um, a pipeline that always goes to staging first. They push the staging. They make sure that the code is actually working properly. Um, then they go to a canary, which is a production node that is a single production node that's getting live traffic. They make sure that their code is working. They look at their monitoring. They look at their dashboards. They let this bake in for a while, make sure that it's not throwing errors, that it's no, that's not doing alerts. Then they go completely to production. If anything goes wrong, all they have to do is go down to a, a, an earlier portion of the pipeline and hit deploy, and the artifacts are already generated. So everything rolls back in a very short period of time. <clears throat> so there are a number of issues running masterless. Um, you are heavily crippling yourself in the salt world when you go masterless because you have no remote execution, which is by far one of salt's most pow powerful features. It also means you have no events. It has uh, nothing other that, and nothing else that requires the master minion um, uh, model. So you are definitely severely limiting yourself here. You have to do remote execution some other way, whether it's Salt SSH, who are actually using Fabric right now, as horrible as that is. Um, mostly because it was already set up before we started using Salt, and everyone's familiar using it. Um, at some point in time, we would actually like to start using a, a master, but only for remote execution. We still want all the file stuff to come from the local system. I've already pushed a feature in for this. If you've not noticed it, you probably shouldn't use it yet. <laughs> um, Um, I, I, don't, I think it's like local use master or something like that. So you can have a file client that's local, but still use a master. Okay. It's a weird feature. Um, so since there is no remote execution, um, it makes v uh, vulnerability remediation more difficult. You push things into states, and you have to do a deploy to everything. In our particular case, since we have a base repository that gets deployed to everything, we make, this, we make a state change in our base repository, and we deploy everything. And a, a minute later, we have, um, we have the, it remediated. It, unfortunately, we don't have a very great r uh, vulnerability tracking as well. So in, in the salt world, you can just say, ask all of the systems, is bash up to date? And then you can push that into the mine. You can push that in, like, into a database using returners or something along those lines. So in this case, we actually use um, etcd for this, and instead of um, instead of pushing a command out that returns data into a system, we just have uh, things in the state run that will ensure that we have stuff in etcd for this. Um, it also means that you don't really have service discovery, which you get through, uh, through the mine in, if you're using master minion. So for this, we're using etcd. It works well-ish. It's, really, um, it's not really as baked in as you would get with the mine system, but it works pretty well. Um, it also means that you have to do your own secret management. This is probably the biggest blocker for doing masterless. Um, in the master minion world, you have pillars that live on the master. You say, these sets of pillars are only allowed to be sets of minions. You don't use grains to protect your pillars. Um, the problem is, um, in masterless, you have to push all your code to your system. So like, where do your, where do your secrets actually come from? There's, a nu there's numerous ways to do this. For instance, in Amazon, you could, use, you could put your secrets into S3, and you can protect them from IAM policy. But those secrets aren't going to be encrypted at rest or anything like that. You could do GPG rendering beforehand and then decrypt it on the systems and have a key per. Um, but we decided that all of these things were too complex. So instead, we wrote a secret service. The secret service uses the new uh, Amazon key management system to generate master keys 
and then to have uh, data keys that are used to, pro uh, to protect all of the credentials for every service. We have an interface that users use to enter the credentials in and map them to services. And then the services themselves have the ability to pull secrets from the service and keep them in memory so that the services themselves can uh, have their credentials at any point in time. We implement this through an external pillar. So there's also some masterless wins. There's actually way more than this. There's so many masterless wins. It's great. Um, the biggest one is that you don't have to deal with node registration at all. So if you're doing scaling, you don't have to worry about how are your auto-scaled nodes going to get approved on your master. Um, you don't have to worry about scaling your master. You don't have to worry about HA of your master. Um, and even though I mentioned that you have to do secret management in masterless, you also have to do secret management in master minion too. Like, you have a pillar system that is protecting your secrets, but how do you get the secrets on your master? And if you're doing HA, how do you replicate those across your masters? This is still a problem either way. So are you going to put them into a GitHub repository? That's not really a great idea. You can still store them in S3, but then they're not also not encrypted. You can do GPG encryption at rest, but you still have to deal with the GPG. So being forced into a mode where you have to do secret management some way is actually somewhat good because it makes you think about your problem and how you're going to deal with it. So all of this is how we deal with uh, the cloud infrastructure and how we deal with the deployment and orchestration of it. But we also have to deal with the development. So in development, we, uh, we started off by having a vagrant virtual machine that would, um, that would launch a service and everything would be inside of the service and, and a virtual machine. And then as the number of services that we have grew, it was, this became very problematic because we'll start one service and it needs five other services to operate. So um, that would not work by doing strict uh, vagrant virtual machines. So instead, um, we have a vagrant virtual machine that is actually boot to Docker. And the boot to Docker virtual machine itself is managed by Salt. It installs all of the stuff necessary to make the system work properly, installs Docker, et cetera. Then um, inside of that, Salt also manages the start and stop and uh, image creation, et cetera, for Docker itself. Um, <coughs> so we have all of our services in Docker containers, but, we, um, but it's completely done by Salt. We have no Docker files. In tests and CI, it's the exact same way. So instead of creating an entire Amazon um, environment with, with auto-scaling groups and ELBs for every single environment. Um, we, we've moved to a model where we're launching Amazon instances for a cluster and we bring up sets of containers that work just like the development systems. This works both for doing testing where Jenkins will tell a set of nodes that they need to launch a set of containers, run tests, and then kill them, or QA where a QA engineer can go to a Jenkins interface and say, I want to launch this profile of a service and it will launch all the containers for a long-lived environment so where they can go in and do all of their uh, QA across multiple feature sets. So they can have like five sets, 10 sets of containers running as they're going through and doing their tests and then destroy all of them when they're done. Um, <coughs> again, this is managed the exact same way as the laptop. So um, completely Docker managed from the Amazon instance point of view and the Docker point of view. And the question is how are we doing Docker with no Docker files? Um, we're using the salt docker modules on the hosts, which if anyone wants to work on these, they need some love, please, please work on them with us. We need some help. Um, on top of these, we're actually using fat containers, using the Fusion base image. Um, the reason for this is because um, we are running on virtual machines in production. They run multiple services. They act like virtual machines. We want our test and CI to work the exact same way. Um, so for these, uh, we use the Fusion base image, but we, we run salt and then uh, we, actually, we start the container using the base image and then we do a run and commit and create our own specific base image. And then every service image past that is also a run and commit. So we never do a Docker build, which means we don't have to have Docker files. Um, similarly, since we're using salt to start the containers, we can also just tell Salt, start the container, run this, uh, run this command, which is the init system for, um, for Fusion, which will go and run Salt, make sure that the container is in the right state. <coughs> and then after we do run commits, we tag these, and then we push them into a private registry. So um, when developers get a new laptop and they pull down all of their images, everything just starts, it runs Salt, everything works exactly like it does in production. 
Um, we've actually uh, done this in such a way to where um, we, we can now build images for every single SHA so that when a developer pulls something down, they can start a container and all it has to do is start its services. So we start containers in roughly 10 seconds, even though we're doing a salt run. Um, so that's all that I have for this. Thanks for listening. And if you have any questions, now is the time. Yes. So you spin up the Docker fusion image, right? Yep. And you run salt on it and then commit that. What's your doing? Yes. So we're using salt to configuration manage our Docker images. So then if that's how you build Docker images, when you do a Docker build, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of caching that goes on that speeds up the build. Yes. And you wouldn't have that when you're building this Docker image. That's correct. So you don't, so then when you need this, so you, there's a separate step then. You have a, a build step where you're building the Docker image and you version that thing. Yes. And we, then you use it over here. We actually never do a build. We always do a run and commit, never do a build. Yes, so we have Jenkins actually build all of our images. Um, so they, uh, we also go on the uh, idea that we can have deltas between our, uh, our images. So they're, they're not always completely. Um, yes, so we build, we build a base image from Fusion. That base image can stay for long periods of time exactly how it is, but the service images are built on top of that. So we kind of are making our own layering system by doing this. but. Um, for each individual service, it applies the complete service every time it's building its image, which in our case is fine. We wanted to do that. It's just like doing a build anyway. In a build, you would generally build completely from scratch most of the time. I personally think that the layers in Docker do not work as well as advertised, and that when you use them, it often, re it often results in downloading like a billion layers. So doing it this way means like each one of these things has, when you download it, a layer, like the layer is pretty large, but um, you don't have to download large numbers of layers. And so for instance, if we were to go to production for this, we could use the exact same model, but instead of running all of our containers on a single system, we could launch an auto scaling group that's like specific to a service, launch its container, and we can bake into the AMI, we could bake in like a, a default base image and some other things, and when it pulls things from that, um, it wouldn't have to pull as many things. It could build straight on top of that. We could build an AMI for each one if we really wanted to. So we could do like kind of double what we're currently doing. And then we'd also still get to use IAM roles and all the other nice stuff that comes along with it. Questions? Um, we could do that, yeah. Um, because we, ha we, we have a custom grain um, that, runs on the, um, that runs on the systems themselves, on the instances that are running their code, which parses a host name and generates grains. So what we did for that is we just modified that grain to add another step that says, if environment variables are there, parse the environment variables instead. And so it was just a matter of like adding a small amount of code instead of injecting the grains every time. But we could, we, in, in fact, at one point in time, we were injecting the grains. Um, <coughs> it's just that this was um, slightly easier and quicker. Did you actually publish your custom grain for the or um, So I, I think we do have a version of it published somewhere. I, like, I have it in a side project somewhere or something along those lines. It's not, it's like, it's pretty specific to us because of our naming scheme. So. It's not terribly helpful. It really, it just takes the host name from the system and parses it into grains. So it's, it would, I don't, I don't know if it would be really helpful upstream. So when you deploy a service, are you, are you deploying a doc, basically a built Docker image that you customize to the So currently in production, we are not um, deploying Docker. You don't, you don't use Docker to be a server. <coughs> Yes, so um, we, we actually have a deployment system um, that is in cron that runs once a minute. And um, that checks S3 to see if there's new tarball artifacts for the service. It pulls them and then it goes through the steps of like doing the next current thing. It runs salt, et cetera. But it's, run, it's written as a salt, um, 
as a salt script, basically. So it includes the salt caller um, API and stuff like that. So it has direct access to grains and pillars and such. Correct. That's for production. For test and CI, we actually do uh, Docker images. Yeah, you, 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 that's very Docker. Correct. Um, at some point in time in production, we'll probably also start using Docker. But and specifically the way that we're using it in test and CI, where we'll have a kind of hybrid model between like what we're doing right now with the next and current thing, but instead of it being tarball artifacts that modify the current state of the system, it would say Docker um, pull this tag. Start um, start the the image or start the inst or start the container with this tag on this port. Um, check to make sure it's running. Switch the ports from port forwarding. Kill the old container so that we have atomic deploys that way. Right. So um, we have a set of SHAs that are listed in S3 that say these are the current set of SHAs that we want on all systems. The deployment system will pull all of those onto the file system into a directory that are like hashed by or that are that have the hash names themselves in the directory. Those shards refer to the artifacts? Yes. They're, they're basically they're just artifacts and shards. Yeah, we tar, um, we we have um, Git repositories on Jenkins yeah. and they're checked out the specific SHA, and when the artifact builds, it tars that up and it names the directory based on the SHA name. So when that gets pulled to the systems, then we have links that point at those things. And the links allow us to do things, uh, like for PHP and Apache, you have to do um, a symlink switch that's atomic if you don't want to have um, like alerts fire because you're having 500s on like a very small number of calls or something like that. So that allows us to do it that way. I think that's time. Uh, one more question. I have a very strong opinion on CloudFormation. I despise CloudFormation. Um, it does lots of magical things that are very annoying. Like it names your resources in like completely asinine ways. It wants to manage everything. If you want to destroy pieces of the infrastructure, you can't. You have to destroy everything that's managed by CloudFormation and then like recreate it. If you change things, it will automatically go through and do things like terminate all your instances and bring new ones in. Um, we like to control that stuff ourselves, and also we, by having our own modules, like we have the ability to do things like um, have a resource that manages its own CloudWatch alarms that are managed through pillars that apply to every um, resource. Whereas with CloudFormation, you can kind of do that, but you have to set up your CloudFormation policy in a specific way, and then we'd have to say like, well, we're going to pull these pieces of that from pillars, and then you have to like deal with YAML indention issues because you're not pulling it from a key, instead you're like injecting it into the YAML. And then you have to worry about like YAML interpretation on top of YAML interpretation. So um, there is a CloudFormation um, state module that uh, someone has submitted that's usable. It has an execution module that goes with it. it I'm sure it works perfectly fine. We just, we're, never prob we're probably never gonna use it. And the second part was that? Oh, uh, pre-baking AMIs. Oh, pre-baking AMIs. We're probably going to start pre-baking AMIs um, just to speed things up. Um, I think from the perspective of immutable infrastructure, they're okay, except they're too slow. Um, this is why we're probably gonna use Docker in production instead of uh, pre-baked AMIs. Great, thanks.